Let's jump into today's story because we're, we're, we're continuing a series that we launched a few weeks ago called What I Deserve, But. Let's just emphasize the word but today. I'm going to say what I deserve and you say but. Amen. What I deserve. But. See, you get a little too excited to say those kind of words in church, don't you? <laughs> I can see how it is. What I deserve, but. Now I want to just jump into today's story because honestly today is less of a preaching message and more of a teaching message, which is kind of unfamiliar territory for me. I'm more of a preacher and I get going. Um, but today I want to teach you a, a, a little something about the Bible that sometimes you don't always understand. There, there are stories in Scripture that you read, but, but if you really dig deep into the story, you understand that like it does mean what you read it to mean, but there is so much more. And, and I'm hoping that as we share this in this kind of a way today, you understand that, oh my gosh, really, is it, I'm missing out on a whole new world of learning who Jesus is and, and, and what the Bible means and what it can mean to me in practical application beyond just what the words say in the story. And that's kind of what I'm attempting to do today in my teaching. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to get very Bible professor-ish. Is that all right? This is not to like, hey, look at me, I know Greek and that kind of thing. Um, because I, I, I know some, but not a lot. I can't speak fluent, um, but I know how to study and research, and that, that's what I want to do. So I'm going to share with you a very familiar story that if you've ever grown up in church or um, anywhere near a church, you've probably heard this story before. But if you haven't, I'm going to read it for you today out of the gate, and then we're going we're gonna to really dissect it. A little bit because I think it has the, 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 the chance to change somebody's life today. Especially when we're talking uh, about what we deserve is rejection. But what we get is acceptance. So let me, let me share this story with you in Luke chapter 19 verses 1 through 10. Jesus went to Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see that, that right there, can we just stop and just like, you know, the, 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 the gauge and the meter of something's fishy here right now because all of us have problems with IRS agents, amen? Because this is the story, this is an IRS agent gone crazy, okay? Um, he was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. Two things that just don't go well together. He wanted to see who Jesus was but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, <laughs> crazy thing happened. Jesus looked up at him and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly, of course. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. And then he wraps up this little story, Luke, in his writing, and he says kind of like the, the purpose of, of why Jesus actually came. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Now, I, I, again, I, I bet you've, you've maybe heard of this story. I, I don't want to take for granted that many of you are first time in a church today, and some of you have just started coming, but... But you've probably heard the story of Zacchaeus because you connect it with him being a wee little man, right? A short little guy. So when I'm reading this story, when I was reading this a couple weeks back, and I, I try to read every familiar passage. And guys, I, I've, I've, I gave my life to Jesus on November 17th, 1976. That, I, was, I was five years old. I'm 47 now. So... I've read the Bible many, many times in my 42 years of knowing Jesus, let alone hearing it before, right? And my, my, day, my, my mind goes back to flannel graph days, 
Anybody raise your hand? No flannel graph days? Oh, yeah. Flannel graph days. And I just was laughing as a kid at, at Zacchaeus' character going up on the board. Way up in this tree. And, and, and by the way, it's inaccurate because a, a, a sycamore fig tree is not as large as the flannel graph. So I have issues with flannel graph designers. It was like this big oak tree. No, no, no. There, there aren't those kind of trees in Israel. been there twice and I've seen the fig trees. But, but uh, anyways, my, my mind goes back to this. So I really try to read stories when I reread them again. Just with different perspectives to see what else God wants to teach me in the moment. And um, I pictured something very similar to what, what, what maybe we just saw, right, when we read this, but even some more. I pictured how this whole thing came about. And when I was reading this story, initially two things came to my mind, two questions that are kind of behind the scenes of this story. And I want to share with those two things first and then a couple observations as we try to break this down today. But here's the first question, if you're a note taker, that really came to my mind. Because this is a, a journey and a quest that this guy is on. And, and, and here's the first question that I came to was that a lot of people I think ask in life. Is there anything, is there anything that can provide me with acceptance? Because I think a lot of us ask that question in our life. And we go on journeys and pursuits to find something to provide us with the acceptance that we are longing. So we meet Zacchaeus, right? He's our main character. Interesting note as we break this down, Zacchaeus' name actually means the righteous one. And in, in old, in, 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 Biblical times, you, you need to know that, that, that a man or woman's Bible name, their name was a definition of, of like their destiny. And, and he was the farthest thing from being righteous, as we're going to find out. So from our past, uh, passage, there's a few things that, that we see. There's three characteristics that Luke refers to that are already working against Zac Zacchaeus. He's, he's a ruler of sorts. He's a chief tax collector and, and he accomplished that through being a toll collector and he's really wealthy now again this makes you scratch your head doesn't it an irs agent that's rich so out of the gate we we already got something like this something's not right and luke tells us that jesus meets zacchaeus as he's passing through jericho we learned in the chapter uh, before that Jesus was drawing near Jericho. So Luke sets up his writing as if this is coming. And he reaches Jericho. And what's Jericho famous for? Sh Joshua, me, right? He fit the battle of Jericho. So, so we know Jericho already has some notoriety in the Bible. But Luke takes a unique and very descriptive approach as he begins to define Zacchaeus to us. Luke is known. Luke is a doctor. He's well-educated. He, he thinks through things before he writes them. You know, that's why Peter only got like two books, you know, and they're short. Luke, Luke, Luke gets a few books that are pretty powerful because he thinks through these things. But he is known to be pretty abrupt and short. Like, I've kind of researched this stuff and this is what I found. And we know this to be the case because in a couple chapters earlier in Luke chapter 16, he's describing the rich man and Lazarus. So we know that, that Luke, probably being a doctor, may have been somewhat wealthy himself. But he understood the dangers of pursuing wealth. And he sets this whole thing up. But here he lingers on the description. And, and again, I'm going to give you several Greek terms today. I, I'm not the best at pronunciating them. Like I said, I always kind of have a Spanish flair to them. Don't know why. Um, but I want you to get the deeper meaning of the story. So, so this, the character we find is, is Zacchaeus. And he's twice referred to by the intensive pronoun autos. And that means he himself. Now, you got to understand, when it's written this way, such a pronoun, it's really grammatically unnecessary to even write it in this way. But its presence in the writing and the original text gives us a hint, something that maybe you never knew. The hint to the reader is this. You need to slow down and pay very close attention to this story. 
That's what it means. And, and, and some of us are like, I've never read it that way. And that's why there's so much more. Okay, and I got, I got more for you to blow your mind today. But it tells you, you need to listen to this story because there's something in here for you. So Zacchaeus is not just a tax or toll collector. He's a chief, archai, chief tax collector. And so we don't miss Luke's special twist that he kind of, you know, drives in. He's really rich, really rich. And just like the blind man that he referred to in Luke chapter 18, Zacchaeus is searching to see Jesus, to see Jesus. And then Luke drops two Greek words that are often glossed over in our English translation that I read at the beginning, literally. In the first part of verse three, he tells us the whole point of the story. He says, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So there's significance in these two things. Now those two words translated who Jesus was are suggestive and they suggest that Zacchaeus not only wanted to just get a good look at Jesus as we might naturally think when reading it, like I'd like to get a good look at him, but wanted to, to do this, ready? Figure out who Jesus really was. He wanted to figure out, he wanted to figure out his essence. He wanted to figure out his person. He wanted to figure out his identity. And Zacchaeus was just, he was not going to be okay with secondhand, with secondhand reports. He wanted to go to the source and figure out himself the truth about Jesus. So he runs ahead of the crowd, climbs a sycamore tree to get a look at Jesus. Time out. Many of you here today that might not have crossed over from death to life into a personal relationship with Jesus are getting secondhand reports as to who Jesus is. With somebody that knows Jesus but ain't acting like Jesus. And I'm here to tell you today, friends, at some point in time, if you keep receiving rejection, rejection, rejection like failure every time I try to find out what the meaning of life is until you come to the point of I want to really 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 know who Jesus is you won't know who Jesus is and it's right here right when the story reads just on the surface we, we get imaginations growing through our mind we, we see a wee little man Scurrying along, rope swishing, <laughs> up through the crowd, gathering through, right? Climbing up a little tree to see Jesus, to get a better view because, because he's short. We know that really, really short or Luke wouldn't have told us that. And you may be wondering why Luke even mentions that Zacchaeus was short. Well, well most likely to give us a glimpse into the life of Zacchaeus and what he may have lived we already know, we already know we live in a wicked and cruel and evil world. I bet your child has come home at least once in their life since they've started school in tears because of how they've been belittled by how they look or by how they act or what they say. Bullying isn't just something new today, guys. So we already kind of have this idea that, that he's lived his entire life with a really, really, really strong sense of rejection. This has been developing all of his life. So, so we know kind of, we'll break it down in a minute. He's tried to suffice those feelings of rejection and, and go on a quest for acceptance. But his quest is often like your quest and my quest in, in our quest for acceptance. We, we go after things that we think will bring us acceptance. Hey, 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 look at me. I got a nice shirt on. Hey, 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 look at me. Do you know how much these shoes cost? Hey, 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 look at me. Do you see the kind of car I drive? Because we think things are going to bring us what we're ultimately in search for, acceptance. Now, we know 
that Zacchaeus gained his wealth by cheating his own people. And it's very well probably understood that, that cheating those who had been... So his actions led him to being rejected even more than just for his size. What he was doing, I think all of us would say, man, if you, if, listen, if I told you that you're going to pay $2,000 more on your IRS uh, income tax filings this year, and, 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 and the guy that was doing it is cheating you, and he's going to take the extra $2,000 and pocket it, you, you're going to be ticked. You're going to feel very much rejected by that. See, I, I tend to believe that acceptance is very important for all of us. To the point in which sometimes all of us, nobody's excluded here, all of us at some point in our time uh, in life, we, we even crave. We even crave acceptance so bad that I bet I could pass a mic around today and we'd have some testimonies of how many stupid things we've done to get acceptance in our life. Look at Matt laughing. He's like, oh, you ain't got time, baby. So what he did was he was skimming off the top. So, so it's clear we know he is seriously rejected by his own Jewish community. However, what he was finding out, which we're kind of reiterating, is his, his path to finding out the, the way of life and, and, and to get that power and prestige, that money and that more, so I can finally be accepted, it, it just wasn't working out for him. It just was lending into him being more and more rejected over and over and over. His path for acceptance was gaining him no ground. No ground. So out of the gate, I, I'm just here to tell you, you, you can keep searching if you want. You can keep... Chasing after that American dream, you can get that second house, you can get that extra, you know, raise and that promotion, or whatever it is, the more, the more, the more, the more. I promise you, the first question, at least so far in this story, where you and I are supposed to as readers pay attention to this story. There is nothing, no thing that will ever provide you with acceptance. But if you don't want to take my word for it and Zacchaeus's and numerous other stories in the Bible, you keep going on that search. I can promise you this, you're still going to end up miserable. You are. So that leads us to the second question. Is there any one? Because it seems to be that many of us move from the thing to the one. Is there any one who can provide me with acceptance? And here is where we introduce Jesus. In our story as well. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I'm always fascinated at this part of the story because here's Jesus just walking along, mobbed by the townspeople, shaking their hands. And then all of a sudden, you know, he just like stops, looks up in a tree it says, Zacchaeus. He doesn't say like the, with the question, like, Zacchaeus? Hey, somebody tell me this guy's name. What, what's his? No, he stops and he calls out a guy that he's never met before. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Can you just imagine in this moment how Zacchaeus felt? A little shocked, first and foremost, that he's getting pointed out in front of all the townspeople. But then that, that shock dissipates and he's like, Dude, one of the hottest talks in town just called me by name in front of all the townspeople. I'm now going to get. Wow. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Ready for a little more Bible lesson? The word translated means immediately and make haste in the KJV. 
It's the Greek word speudo, which means to hurry and hasten. So in essence, it's indicating that Jesus was basically telling Zacchaeus, we don't need to make an appointment, dude. The appointment is now. In other words, Jesus was saying, now is the time to meet me. Let those words sink in this morning. If you've been running, 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 trying to find that so badly with everything else and anyone else, Jesus says to Zacchaeus, now, now is the time to meet me. The phrase must stay and must abide in the KJV is also interesting. It uses the Greek word dei, which means to be under necessity of happening, or it is necessary, one must, one has to, denoting it's basically compulsion. So in other words, uh, the stay and abide in the Greek is meno, and that means to remain or stay, often in a very special sense, to live, dwell, or lodge. So with all of that said, here's what that text, that phrase, Zacchaeus, come down immediately, I must stay at your house today. This is Jesus telling Zacchaeus that he must, there are no ifs, ands, and buts about it, he must come to dinner now, immediately. Let this resonate, friends. If you're running from Jesus and every time you have an encounter and you're having an encounter right now and you're running and you're pursuing, you know, I don't want Jesus to help me with this. I don't need Jesus in my life. Why in the world do you think you're here today? Because just as Jesus is telling Zacchaeus, he's looking straight at you and saying whatever your name is. Now, Immediately, this cannot wait. It's time for you and me to meet. Zacchaeus is overjoyed. He's been a social outcast, rejected, and he's offered the opportunity to host one of the most famous men in the country. And everyone was there to witness it, so he scrambles down the tree. Zacchaeus is like, I want to just wrap your brain around this so far. Zacchaeus is like, I want to see who this Jesus is. He tries to push himself through the crowd. He's a short little dude, right? You know, he's wobbling around. He gets an elbow to the head and he's like, this is getting old. So he just ducks down, gets through, does his little waddle down the street. I'm going to get out ahead. I'm going to see this. I got to get out ahead of them so I can see this Jesus. He fights his way to, through the crowd. He climbs up in a tree, right? And now you get this, right? It's a grown man climbing a tree in a robe. So already we're beginning to see some outrageous behavior, right? Just picture in your mind, have you ever seen your husband climb a tree in their bathrobe? That's what's going on here. It's pretty unstylish. It's pretty undignified. Why in the world would he do this? Because, 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 because Zacchaeus' life search has been for that. It's been for that. But it's been filled with that. And it has now led him, at least to the point in this part of the story, to do something pretty outrageous. Because if this backfires, let's face it, right? If this backfires, he's always been ridiculed for being yay tall. And now he's up in a tree. Can you imagine if Jesus just keeps passing by? How much more? Of that he's going to receive. Look, look at Zacchaeus. Look at him. It's led him to see if Jesus really is who he said he is. If even half of what I've heard about Jesus is true, is he really worth me seeking after more than the more that I'm seeking after? Which kind of leads us to another time out, and that's the question for you today. If Jesus really is, who he said he was and who he says he is. If you come each week and you listen to us preach about who he is and who he says he is, is there really, 
is there really anything else in life that's more important? Now be careful how you answer that because many of us are living as if there's a lot of other things more important than Jesus. Is there anything more important than finding out, figuring out, regardless if I'm pre-Jesus or post-Jesus, then, then how can I get even a closer relationship with this guy? It kind of literally makes the words of Matthew chapter eleven twenty six 26 jump off the page, right? Where it says, what good will it be for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, you, you got to understand something here that's literally shocking that this story this story is scandalous it, it is scandalous we're we're talking about somebody doing the unthinkable way beyond our ability to to comprehend because Zacchaeus I've already clearly stated and kind of presented the case he is absolutely deserving of rejection he is cheating his own people because of his life and behavior he he deserves this he deserves it. He's kind of like the mafia. He was on, he was on, right, the, 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 um, the, the, he was committing treason. He's on America's most wanted list. He's the worst of the worst, guys. In that day and age, he was. But, but, praise Jesus for but, but here we are about to see Jesus give him something that he does not deserve. And it's remarkable and it's, it's unexplainable. D.L. Moody, famous evangelist. Gosh, powerful thing that he said about this story. And I just love it because it's like we, we try to figure out the theological meaning behind everything. And I just love what D.L. Moody said. He, he simplifies this saving grace moment. And he says this, he says, Jesus saved Zacchaeus. I believe Jesus saved, saved Zacchaeus. Catch this. In the distance from the limb that he was sitting on to the time it took him to get to the ground. I, I love this because so many people want to complicate salvation. Religion has done that, you know, right? Religion, every religion that you have ever been a part of or ever heard about teaches you that it's what you have to do to work your way to him. But we've, we've made that case here many times. If you haven't been here, we've told you the gospel is simple. It's Jesus plus nothing. So, so, so don't complicate it anymore. And, and, you, and you complicate it even more with like, my life has been this way. Here, there's a reason for it. There's no way that Jesus could ever forgive me, save me. Are you kidding me? If what D.L. Moody is stating is true, I love this. From the time it took Zacchaeus to get from the limb to the ground, Jesus radically changed his mind. So, so break this down, okay? For you and me in a sycamore fig tree, um, you know, it, it might take lesser time, but for a wee little man, right? 15, 20 seconds, 30 seconds to climb down in that moment because Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down at, at once. So in the distance, maybe let's just go with 20 seconds for today. 20 seconds. 20 seconds it takes for Zacchaeus to climb down from that tree to the ground. In that time frame, Jesus completely transforms Zacchaeus. In that short a time, we're talking, guys, no, you all should be on your feet clapping because this is amazing. In the, in the short amount of time, He's lived his whole life feeling that way and pursuing this and taking things into his own hands. He's just like you. He's just like me. And in that moment of time, Jesus transforms his life. Are you kidding me? Because here's the day. If, if D.L. Moody's point is accurate, in just a matter of seconds, you can move. Listen, somebody needs to hear this today. In just a matter of seconds, you can move from getting what you deserve to getting what you don't deserve. In just a matter of seconds, you can be totally and completely transformed by the grace of Jesus. In just a matter of seconds, you can move from a life that's filled with rejection to a life now filled with acceptance. When you encounter Jesus, listen, So I have to guard my flesh. Because what I'm about to say next 
may give explanation as to why sometimes there's splatterings of applause and certain things. Here's how we know that you have encountered Jesus. You see it in this story. And you see it in story after story after story. When someone encounters Jesus, there is apparently immediate evidence of a transformed life. Let me go further. There's not just immediate evidence, there's lasting evidence. And that's what we see here. But most of us, most of us, if not all of us, have pursued so many things, so many other things in our life with more excitement and zeal than we pursue God. I really think the question at this point in the message is this. That you've got to ask yourself personally. Is Jesus really, really worth pursuing more than anything else in my life? Now here's what you might discover. If you answer that question honestly, and you're like, yes, today I'm done. If you answer that, here's what you're going to discover. I know this because I'm personal testimony to it. As you begin to answer that question with your lifestyle and start pursuing Jesus more than anything else in your life, here's what you're going to discover, which is an amazing thing, and you, you just, you, you, you won't get it until you do it. You're going to discover that Jesus has been pursuing you the whole time. All right, let, 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 me, let me attempt to explain that to you just to break it down and, and with four observations and, and then we're done with the story and we'll, we'll stay in context with it. Here's, here's my way of kind of defining how as you begin to, with everything that you have, stop pursuing money, more prestige, all of that stuff that you think is gonna get you that, but it still leaves you feeling like that. I'm gonna show you how... You pursuing him actually helps you identify that he's pursuing you. Here's the first one. The first observation from our stories that continues is Jesus is now, Jesus is now the guest of a sinner. That, do you know how much grace is in just that statement alone? Jesus is now, which means it should, it should just like any type of doubt or uncertainty in your life of who you are and where you've gotten away from Jesus, it should just melt off of you right now because it tells you that Jesus is willing to be your friend. He's willing to be your guest, okay? Because we're talking about the worst of the worst with Zacchaeus. All the people saw this and began to mutter. Of course they muttered. Everybody, everybody that has a serious life change, you question whether or not it was a serious life change, right? They begin to mutter and they say, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. And here's my question on this first point is this. Aren't you glad that Jesus is willing to love and accept you whether or not you have the approval of other people? Watch what happens next, nothing short of amazing. This is kind of a requirement. This is kind of a requirement with pursuing Jesus with everything that you have, okay? Ready? Zacchaeus repents. Amen. Now we're getting into dangerous territory, right? Now people are like, I don't know if I'm gonna clap on this part right now. <laughs> See, what repentance is, and we're gonna talk about it a little bit more next week too, but there's instant change. There's, there's, there's no longer the same. It means an immediate change of direction. And point in case, like I said, because I believe what D.L. Moody believes from the time that it took him to get from the limb to the ground, Jesus radically transformed him. And then instantly we read, and Luke, tell, Luke tells us this because he don't mix words in his writings. He says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay that back four times the amount. See, here's what's happening. When you encounter Jesus and you want to know if I really have encountered Jesus, here it is, ready? Zacchaeus enters into the presence of holiness and because sin cannot be in the presence of holiness, something has to change and it ain't going to be Jesus. It ain't going to be Jesus. Something has to change. It says that Zacchaeus stood up, indicating he'd obviously fallen to his knees before Jesus, 
and he immediately, guys, he doesn't wait a couple minutes. He doesn't, hey, come back to my house. I'll show you the way. No, he immediately recognizes something that is so foreign to him in his life that's been filled with rejection. Here's what he, here's what he immediately encounters. Acceptance. Acceptance. He realized that receiving something that he did not deserve, accepted acceptance from Jesus, this is crazy, but it demanded a response from him. It demanded a response from him. Zacchaeus offers, give half his possessions to the poor. In one stroke, he pledges half of his possessions to the poor. Half. And we struggle with 10%. Sm smattering applauses. Fifty percent. Some of you are already justifying. Well, he was wealthy. <laughs> well, I got another story for you. It's called a widow's mite. This goes far beyond what rabbis consider generous, which was twenty percent. And not only fifty percent. He offers restitution to anybody that he has ever wronged. Four times the amount. Four times the amount. Now listen, this is where our minds and our eyes deceive us sometimes with just reading the words on a story in a page so quickly without sometimes digging deeper. In the English translations, when I said that Zacchaeus said, if I have cheated anybody, normally we might read that and say that he's not quite taking responsibility for cheating people. It's kind of hypothetical, right? In his question, like, if I've even done this. Well, the verb translated, I'm getting Bible professor again. The verb translated right here that says cheated is the Greek, and this is where I'm going to blow it, sukofenteo which means to, to secure something through intimidation or extort, which is indication to us in its original writing that it was not Zacchaeus suggesting that he might have cheated. He was owning that he was a cheater. See, this is the moment in which Zacchaeus realized, I, I don't think maybe I'm a sinner. I am a sinner. See, you, you will never... You will never be able to have an experience, an encounter with Jesus and a transformed life if you can't first come to the point that you're a sinner. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. The only difference between you and me, if you haven't said yes to Jesus, is I'm just a sinner that's been forgiven by God's grace, but I'm still very much a sinner. And Ginger said, <laughs> amen. And here's how we know that. The conditional clause that's used here in the original writing doesn't place any doubt in the fact that extortion happened. It places nothing but evidence of it actually happening. You, do you see what you're missing out sometimes when you just read the words on a page? So much more for you to understand. That's why every time that I read the Bible, something new comes to life. We got a guy just a few hours earlier who'd experienced nothing but that and he increased it because of how his lifestyle and his pursuit because he worshipped money. He worshipped money. He believed that everything that he gained, money and more, would provide me with acceptance. And now we got a guy that's saying, I want to give half of my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay it back four times the amount. Do you see? Do you see, friends, what is happening in this moment? In just a matter of seconds from the distance between the limb to the ground, Zacchaeus is talking crazy talk. Crazy talk. He's instantly making wrong things right. What in the world is going on? Why is Zacchaeus doing this? It's because it's what somebody does that doesn't get what they deserve gets. See, you got to understand something. Zacchaeus did not do this to get 
the acceptance from Jesus. He instantly did this because he had already got the acceptance from Jesus. You know what this is? This, this is this. This is an extravagant response to God's extravagant love. This is what you do. This is what you do when you get what you don't deserve. The third one, it's worth noting, I'll be quick. A little jab from Jesus. What story would be it's Jesus' story without him just kind of, you know, taking one little shot at everybody else around, right? We know how he was with the Pharisees at this point in time. He says this, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. Now there is major significance in this moment because first and foremost, you need to understand something. Everybody in that town believed this Jewish person is no longer Jewish because they are doing things to their, fam- their friends, their family, their townspeople that no other Jewish people would do. He was excommunicated. He deserved, he deserved rejection. He deserved rejection. So all of that community did not look at Zacchaeus and think that he was a Jew. Which in that day and age, it meant that you were a son of Abraham. Significance, whole nother story. But Jesus turns this moment into a teaching moment and he recognizes Zacchaeus' immediate repentance and he declares that Zacchaeus has received salvation today. Here's what I mean, ready? A little more Bible knowledge. The Greek word used here is soteria, which means salvation, health, and deliverance. So Jesus instantly recognizes the instant repentance and he declares Zacchaeus' actions as an evident repentance. And he reaffirms in that moment in front of everybody, it's been ridicule, ridicule, ridicule. Because of what you've done to us, because of what you've done to us, because of what you've done to us, Jesus says, no, 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 no. He's the son of Abraham. If you say yes to Jesus, I'm just gonna be honest with you, life's not always gonna be great. If you're making a commitment to Christ because you think it's going to be better on this side of Jesus than it was on this side of Jesus, you realize that you're crossing over to the few as opposed to the many. You, you know because you, you, you're having an encounter with Jesus, I'm going to have to change some of my ways. Because, because... Jesus deserves my change. And while everybody else points at you and ridicules you and you feel like you're just experiencing more and more rejection, do you realize the only person's opinion of you that matters is Jesus and he's already given you that? And Jesus calls out to his neighbors who've been following him, wanting a little piece of Jesus all day. He says, hey guys, this guy, you need to welcome him and you need to accept him from now on. He just publicly declared, this guy deserves this now, even though you think he deserves this, he's getting this. And that's why right here in our our third, or our fourth and final observation is this, that we, we see that this is kind of the message for you and all of us. It's the mission of Jesus. He, he, he gives acceptance to, to all, to all. You, 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 all who have been rejected. He states it in the bottom line of this, of this story. For, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The final passage of this section in Luke's gospel contains basically the mission of Jesus, right? The son of man has come come to seek and save the lost. And and that is indicated in its writing in the essence of a shepherd, which these people knew what a shepherd was because they, they were that type of people, farmers, shepherds across the board. And this was the indicator in Luke's gospel. And this is what this story is all about today. And it's what everybody else's story is today as well. It's very natural. It's very natural as a sinner, which we all do, to feel rejected. 
So we go on our quests and our journeys in search and pursuit of, of acceptance. But, I'll praise Jesus for but. But, just like Zacchaeus, as he said, he's worth pursuing. He quickly, immediately, 30 seconds, realized that Jesus had been pursuing him. Jesus shows us what real acceptance looks like. Luke wrote about it a few chapters earlier in 15. You've probably heard this parable. Maybe you haven't. I'm going to read it for you. It's called the parable of the lost sheep. And this is Jesus' mission. Somebody needs to hear this today. Then Jesus told them this parable. He said, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Do you leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me. I found the one lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is my story. This is your story. It's not just Zacchaeus' story. And I, for one, am beyond thrilled that God thought I was worth searching for. Because I deserve rejection. But God has given me acceptance. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? I really need you to understand this today, friends. If you haven't heard anything I've said, please hear this. Heart change leads to life change, period. When you receive what you don't deserve, it changes you. I'm going to say something really bold, and some of you are going to maybe question it. But if it has to change you or you haven't received it. Because when you're transformed by Jesus, there's evidence. You know what that evidence is? It's called fruit in the Bible, but let me give you another definition, kind of modern day. Here's the evidence that you've encountered Jesus and you've been transformed by him. You start doing weird things. You start doing really strange things, like forgiving people that don't deserve to be forgiven. Like loving people who don't deserve to be loved. However that translation, you stop doing what you were doing that wasn't glorifying to God. You stop hanging around certain people. You actually start doing things that the church suggests and encourages and counsels you to do because they're biblical steps of obedience. You start doing weird things. How weird, Josh? I just throw this out there because it's just fun. You start like tithing 10% of your gross income. That's weird. That's weird. That's weird. You start doing things that don't make much sense. Why? Tell me why we do this, Josh. Because extravagant love demands an extravagant response. And you deserve to set rejection and I deserve this rejection but God's chosen to give me acceptance and that demands a response from me would you stand to your feet all heads are bowed and eyes are closed today if you're here today and you're 
on the other side of Jesus. You've had an encounter with him, but you've kind of lost touch with what that encounter means in your life. And you're, struggle, you're struggling with the response as of late. Like in the beginning, you'd do anything. But now it's kind of like, once again, it's like embarrassing. Ah, I'll put it off, put it off. I think you're probably discovering, because I have on many occasions since I've known Jesus, I'll put it off, put it off. And I'm like, I never get back around to doing what I was doing, which was crazy and radical. So if you're post Jesus today, and you're ready to get back on track and realize that he's given you acceptance no matter what, and you want to recommit your life, recommit your direction, Recommit your transformation. The altars are going to be open. We've got some friends that are in the front. They've got name tags. They're incredible people. What's next counselors? They're willing to pray with you, help you take those steps. We even got things here at the church that can give you guidance in how to get back on track. Please do that as we sing this last song. And if, if, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you're the lost sheep. And from the moment that you were born, Jesus has desired and craved a relationship with you. And if you would just come to the point of saying, is he really worth pursuing? And you start it, you start that journey, you're going to discover today that he's been pursuing for you all along. And you can cross over from death to life today. And we would love nothing more, nothing more than to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in a practical way to you. If you'd like to come forward, we'd love to share that with you. Let me pray for you. Jesus, thanks. Thanks for today. We worship you, we praise you, we give you all the glory. I pray, God, right now, somebody, somebody changes. Somebody changes their course today. And you're precious in your holy son's name. And all God's people say, would you come forward right now? Don't even wait. Just come forward as we sing this song.